So hi, friends. Here we are with Ann Wright, who, who's had a full 29-year career in the Army, ended up being a colonel, but then resigned in protest to the Iraq War. And, and all that time has been a leading voice against the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, uh, our nation's military advance, uh, adventuring all around the world. How, how you doing, Ann? Thank you, I'm doing well and great to be with you all today. So first thing I'd like to start in, in responding to this interview you request, you said you're about to get on a plane to go to Malta to participate in the Gaza flotilla. Uh, Sharon and I know about that from reading your articles and others, but can you tell people what's going on with that and what's the point and what you hope to accomplish? Surely, well, we've been uh, working uh, to try to uh, in the illegal Israeli naval blockade of Gaza for, uh, gosh, 16 years now. It started in 2008 with the Free Gaza Movement, and they sent five little boats and were able to actually to get into Gaza in 2008. Uh, first time in 40 years that international boats had, had been able to go into Gaza City Harbor. But in late 2008, that's when uh, cast lead, the Israeli attack on Gaza started 27 days that went into 2008 and then 2009. And that's when the Israelis uh, started ramming boats and almost sunk one of the free Gaza uh, boats. Um, 2010, we had the seven, uh, seven ship flotilla, the Marvi Marmara, on which uh, nine people were executed by Israeli commandos as they came onto the boat. 50 people were wounded. I was on the flotilla, not on the Marvi Marmara, but on a, an accompanying boat called the Challenger One. All seven of the boats were attacked by the Israelis, people beaten up. Uh, we were taken, arrested, taken against our will uh, to a place we didn't want to go, Israel. Uh, the boat confiscated, we were put in prison, and then uh, ultimately deported from Israel. And that, that flotilla concept has been going on uh, till today, and in fact, uh, here it is, 2024, and we have one little boat called the Hondola, which is uh, right now in France, going into Italy, then it'll go down to Malta, and then it will head towards Gaza uh, as another one of the challenges to really the air, uh, land, and sea blockade that Gaza, that Israel has on, on Gaza. Um, it is uh, the first time that we've sent a boat during a uh, war situation. And so we are definitely evaluating what is happening in the region. And we're not sending anybody on a, a suicide mission, that's for sure. Uh, but we do think it's important that uh, citizens have the opportunity to challenge uh, these illegal things that Israel is doing. And when our governments won't do anything. I mean, we're all so frustrated with the U U.S. government that's complicit in the genocide of Gaza. Uh, so the least we can do is to try to send some boats to bring attention to the fact that citizens around the world are horrified about all of our governments doing absolutely nothing to stop the Israeli genocide of Gaza. So that's one part of it. We have one boat that is going. We have three boats in Turkey that have been refused um, departure from Turkey, and we're going after the Turkish government on that. Um, we have one boat that's ready to go, and uh, we have just had to tell our uh, participants that it looks like we have an indefinite hold on that boat because we can't get the Turkish government to agree to let the boat leave Turkey. However, today, we're now hearing that the Turkish government has been involved very deeply in a prisoner exchange program. Uh, where 27 uh, people from from many countries and seven nations taking being a part of this uh, prisoner swap and it may be that it the turkish government um, was consumed by you know this very important prisoner exchange thing and maybe they just didn't want another little boat to get in the way of of uh, all of these negotiations that were going on between nato countries uh, and Russia and other countries. So uh, I'm hopeful that maybe now that this prisoner swap has happened, maybe the Turkish government will relent and will be able to move another boat as a part of the Gaza flotilla. We're just so um, honored that you allow us to publish your content 
Um, the work that you you're doing is just nothing nothing short of just just phenomenal. I'm interested in your um, the morphing of of Anne Wright from being a career military person to doing what you're doing now. Was it did it happen like with the flip of a switch or was it gradual? Could you see but 15 years ago, could you see yourself or 20 years ago, could you see yourself doing what you're doing today with the flotilla? <laughs> no, <laughs> I certainly couldn't. As you mentioned, I had a long, uh, long stint with the U.S. military, and now I have my Veterans Against Genocide shirt on with Veterans for Peace. Um, I was 29 years in the U.S. military, the Army and Army Reserves, and then I joined the State Department and was with uh, as a U.S. diplomat for 16 years and served in U.S. embassies in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia. I helped reopen the embassy in Afghanistan in December of 2001 and then went on to Mongolia. And it was there in March of 2003 that I resigned in opposition to the Bush war on Iraq. And that um, and that's 20, 21 years ago. Uh, and since then, I've been working with peace groups all over the United States and all over the world. And I must say that when I resigned, I actually didn't know one person in the U.S. peace community. I, I mean, my focus wasn't on dissidents in the U.S. My focus was dissidents in other countries of the world. No. Uh, so when I finally became a bit of a dissident myself, it was, um, you know, who who's out there? What are people doing? Because I really ha hadn't kept track of a lot of the, the excellent work that had been done by peace activists here in our own country. But very quickly, um, people found me, and uh, I, I've been busy ever since helping with Code Pink Women for Peace, Veterans for Peace, uh, Peace Action, World Beyond War, International Peace Bureau, No to NATO. Uh, you name it, and I'll work with them. It's if it's for nonviolence and for peace. Wonderful. You know, it's so interesting how we all can kind of live in our silos. And I'm wondering, were you surprised when you found out the size of the peace movement? How many people have been just deeply uh, working together for peace? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly during the D Vietnam War, uh, I knew that there was a lot of dissent, and actually for the war on Iraq. While, while I was still in Mongolia, those were the days of the biggest peace marches since around the world since the Vietnam era. So I did know that there were a lot of people all over the world that uh, were uh, solidly against the decision of the, the Bush administration to invade and occupy Iraq. And um, but I didn't really know the names of the organizations. I didn't know how big they were or anything like that. So it was quite a learning experience for me to uh, to find out and to meet, you know, the individuals that have been working so hard for all these decades on trying to stop our government's uh, uh, propensity to use war instead of diplomacy to resolve international issues. Yeah, so so I'm a veteran too, and I believe at one time I I sent in uh, money to sign up for Veterans for Peace. Certainly, I've been against the war since uh, I found out what war is about. But you say you're not going on a suicide mission, and yet uh, every day we see Israel has no compunction about killing people. Your article talks about 186,000 people who have been killed in the last nine months by Israel, Palestinians by by and large, in a couple of days, what was it, 89 Palestinians were killed. You're, you're, I mean, this little boat trip you're taking puts you in, in, in desperate harm, does it not? Well, it does. And, you know, as I mentioned before, we've had one ship that, that the Israelis killed nine people and a, one other person subsequently died from his injuries and 50 wounded. Uh, we will not, you know, that we have to really closely evaluate what the conditions are uh, on as the weeks approach of when we will send this little boat into a danger zone. Uh, and uh, we will we will evaluate that um, as a coalition. And then the captain himself uh, does an evaluation because the captain of the ship 
um, is the ultimate rule on this thing. And uh, if the conditions are such that we do not feel comfortable at all, and I mean, I, and I don't feel comfortable right now, but we are going to, to sail that boat to get publicity for the continuing genocide. We may not put it directly into the danger zone this time, because as you mentioned, uh, the Israelis are killing everybody and they have no uh, no compunction about not, I mean, nobody is safe. Nobody is safe. And we as international should anticipate that uh, the Israelis will treat us uh, just like they do um, the Palestinians, that they've, they've already killed internationals at will. The prison system that we have gone into before is totally uh, filled with Palestinian prisoners that are being treated horribly with torture, with rape, with all sorts of things. So we should not expect to get any light treatment uh, should should this boat actually be captured by, by the Israelis. So we'll be really carefully evaluating everything uh, as as the time approaches about that danger zone. So let's talk a little bit about this this article that uh, the last article that you published here at the LA Progressive, where you talk about Netanyahu coming and addressing um, the United States Congress and the amount of security that we provided, the taxpayers provided. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about that because I don't think average person really has a clue. Well, that's that's for sure. We and unless you're really in Washington D.C. and see what happens here when they have what's called a national security event. And that means that the federal government has designated uh, something that's happening uh, as, a, as something so important and the, prob the possibility for uh, danger to arise from it means that law enforcement uh, groups from all over the country will come into Washington to help the DC police, the Secret Service, all of these federal agencies to help them out. Well, the, the weekend before Netanyahu came to give this speech before the Congress was the NATO uh, three-day events from the, I think it was the 7th through the 9th of, uh, of uh, um, July. And, uh, you know, you had the heads of state of 32 NATO countries plus uh, four of the uh, partners, uh, well, actually eight partners, four of whom were coming from Asia. Um, you had a lot of heads of state that were in this city. And, and the convention center where they held the NATO conference was uh, fenced off uh, for about two blocks outside of it with a big, big fence. And they, they fenced it off about a, a two days early. Uh, so it was a very, very secure area for these 32 heads of nation. Well, when Netanyahu, the prime minister of one country, a tiny little country, one small little country, the, the security for that man outdid the security for 40 heads of state uh, by volumes. The whole U.S. Capitol area was fenced. Uh, the, the area down by the White House fenced off. Uh, every place, the Watergate Hotel and apartment complex where he stayed was totally fenced with, you know, 12 foot high barrier fences with all sorts of police everywhere. The 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 uh, uh, road networks were jammed with uh, police cars. I would say that the amount of money that, that we don't know for sure how much uh, was spent on either one of those, but. Uh, from just the level of fencing and the amount of police on the streets, it had to be at least five times more for one person, Netanyahu, than for 40 heads of state, which is quite, quite remarkable that, uh, that actually that the U.S. Congress and the administration would say, okay, it's really worth having this one person come in to speak at the U.S. Congress on an issue that we are, we the U.S. government are complicit in the genocide of Palestinians in Gaza, and we are willing to bring this guy at invitation of the U.S. Congress to speak to a joint session of the Congress and spend all this money on his security uh, for this one one event, and and the complicity of the United States in this criminal act that he is doing was just more than one could take. And then when you watched his presentation at the 
at the U.S. Congress where these congressmen and women were standing up. I think it was something like 50 standing ovations. It was the most sickening thing I've ever seen in my life. And even though there were over 100 uh, members of Congress that refused to go to uh, to the the joint session of Congress, you had the one person, Rashida Tlaib, who was sitting in that that um, joint session of Congress with her little sign that said "War Criminal" and "Stop the Genocide." It was just uh, it was a horrible, horrible stain on the history of the United States for that to have happened. Yeah, and and she was even told to to uh, either leave or take down the sign. So yes. your, your article also talks about the effort, the efforts of the International Court of Justice to somehow hold Israel or Netanyahu accountable. They've requested an arrest warrant for Netanyahu as a war criminal. They're demanding a ceasefire to hostilities, a ceasing of the new settlements, which is such a big part of the hostilities, and and uh, and and not having uh, foreign nations recognize Israel's right to uh, occupy Palestine. Do, do you think that's any of that's ever going to have a real effect? Well, the fact that the International Court of Justice has come down with these uh, rulings is very, very important because it's taken a lot to get the court to receive these cases and to actually adjudicate them. So we have now on record, you know, that all the occupation, the settlements, all of these things are are against international law, and it's there written out in the court opinion of the highest court, the International Court of Justice. So the implementation of all of that is the big question, uh, and whether or not there will ever be, from the International Criminal R criminal Court, a separate court, whether the court will actually uh, adjudicate that the arrest warrants for Netanyahu and other members of the uh, Israeli government as well as some of the uh, members of the senior leadership of Hamas, whether any of those arrest warrants will actually be issued. But at least the warning is out there that uh, uh, there is evidence that uh, war crimes have been committed, and we hope that there is an enforcement mechanism at some stage. <clears throat> Pardon me. But, you know, in, in Europe, there are certain countries that Netanyahu will not, will not go to, uh, just as George Bush and the Bush administration would not go to some countries in Europe because of the uh, universal jurisdiction and the uh, the uh, decision of courts that the war on Iraq was an illegal war. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we try we try to keep these videos uh, less than um, like 15 minutes is actually ideal, but it's impossible to do that, especially <laughs> with people like you. But I do want to have I want one final question, and that is, you know, when you first entered this whole arena of peace, um, um, clearly you had been involved with the military and with the State Department for many decades. Um, do your friends in the State Department at the Pentagon? Do they, are, are you still in contact with them? Do they wonder if you've lost your mind or do they share some of the concerns that you have? Well, I'm not in touch with a lot of uh, my uh, former colleagues in the State Department and the and the military. You know, it's been 21 years, but uh, uh, the one, I, I have really not gotten any pushback from any of my former colleagues that it's turned out uh, that they they recognize that the war on Iraq was horrible. It should never have happened. Uh, our military that had to prosecute that war, as you can certainly see from the numbers of uh, mental, mental problems, the PTSD, the moral injury, um, plus the physical injuries, uh, and the weight of of the deaths of so many tens of thousands of Iraqis and tens of thousands of Afghans weigh heavily on those men and women that, that went to those wars. So, um, you know, I, I'm i glad I went ahead and resigned. It has uh, put me into a, a wonderful world of great people who challenge our government's propensity to use war instead of, of of diplomacy to resolve issues. So, and I thank you all in the LA Progressive for writing about all of these issues and keeping us well, well informed with a wonderful variety of authors that you 
uh, you publish. So thank you all very much. I have a last question too. So Kamala Harris gave Netanyahu a somewhat frostier reception than, than he's gotten in the past. Do you hold out any hope that a, that a Kamala Harris uh, administration uh, would, would take a different tack? I do hold out hope for it. And I think that's why there's got to be a lot of pressure on her and the Democratic Party during the Democratic National Convention. Uh, every place that she speaks as a part of the Harris for President campaign, we have to be there. We have to be there to encourage her to come out forcefully saying the genocide in Gaza must stop, which she has actually said now. Uh, but she needs to make sure that the U.S. does not send any more weapons to Israel, that actually we put a blockade on Israel saying, until you stop all this stuff, there's not going to be anything going into that country. We have a naval blockade of, of Israel. So there are a lot of things that she could do uh, to, uh, to stop the Israeli uh, prosecution of the genocide in Gaza, plus the assassinations of all these people all over the Middle East that are going that have caused, uh, of course, a great uh, uh, consternation in the region. Uh, not only wars, but uh, ecological things, environmental things. We want her to put a good plat platform out there that people can say, okay, now I know there is difference between what she and Biden, although Biden has done a lot of good things, but definitely on on Gaza, he has been horrible, horrible. So uh, we do hold out hope for her because uh, we definitely don't want Donald Trump in there, for God's sakes. Um, Jill Stein, as a Green Party candidate, has all the right politics, but trying to get her elected is just, it won't, I, I always hope for miracles. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> If uh, if we could get Kamala to take some of the, the stances that Jill Stein has, then we'd be in much better shape. That's right. Well, Anne Wright, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate so much the work that you are doing and say hello to Medea. And oh, we'll do that. <laughs> we certainly will. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll catch up with you again sometime soon. It'll be so my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.